What's happened? Why are you here? Who has crucified your Lord? But I heard you yell, crucify, in the awful silence of your souls. Please be seated. The music being offered by the choir this, this evening by Kay Lee Scott uh, was purchased by the choir um, after uh, Jim Larrabee's father passed away and is dedicated uh, uh, to Jim in light of his father's passing, bringing ex an extra note uh, being spoken and sung um, amidst this night in which we honor the death of Christ. The music points to Psalm 53, which is one of four pieces of poetry or songs, as some call them, that appear in the book of Isaiah between the chapters 42 and 55. Uh, they are known as the songs or poems of the suffering servant that speak of a servant who will come and establish justice in the land, and through their, this person's sufferings, the world will find blessing and healing. Many over the centuries have debated uh, who this servant is. Is it a king who would arise in Israel? Is it Israel 
itself? Or is it someone else? Christians have seen in this in these songs a sign of one that they know as Jesus, but you be the judge. Let us pray. Most holy God, on this most frightening of evenings, we must admit that we, we don't really want to be here. For before this cross stands a fierceness. It casts a shadow that includes us. It feels like an accusation. Somehow before this cross, the illusions that we create that the world is basically an okay place and that we are basically okay people stands judged. In the shadow of this cross, we can no longer affirm that all we need is a a life coach or a personal trainer to make everything okay. No, at the base of this cross, we come to know there is something deeply wrong with our relationship with you. And yet, while we don't want to be here, somehow we find ourselves drawn here anyway. Some deeper intuition that this cross marks not an end of life, but a beginning. Not an accusation, ultimately, but a strange and fierce and mysterious invitation. Open our hearts this night that we may hear your invitation most clearly and respond to it most faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one crucified and the one whose crucifixion marks the beginning of our lives, not the end. Amen. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look on him, nor beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom we turn our faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Israel was in exile. They were sorely in need of something new something breaking through. And yet to be prepared for something new, we must practice being open to new things. What's your picture of Jesus? Does he look something like this? How about this? How many of you thought of this? Or this? That one makes you smile. The shepherd. If you were to describe Jesus to a friend, what words would you use? How would you describe Jesus? A shepherd? A friend? A savior? 
Lord, King, Light, a whirlwind. What is your picture of Jesus? Can you conjure that up in your head and put words together with it? How would you describe that? Close your eyes. What's your picture of Jesus? Now listen as I read how the Bible describes Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender plant as a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look on him nor beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom we turn our faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. How do you see him now?
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. But he was pierced for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastening which brought our peace fell to him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, turning every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this last week, uh, Jim Larrabee and I were both interviewed by the Omaha World Herald uh, uh, regarding our use of music in church. Uh, part of an article that will probably come out tomorrow or Sunday about many churches in Omaha and how they use music. And the reporter asked, uh, asked if we use our classical and our jazz music to, uh, to lure the public in with, with wonderful music as a marketing thing. I had to laugh lure the public in for marketing purposes, really. Let's consider the marketing of Isaiah. If we're going to get our message right, Jesus is the one who moves us into service in his footprint, footsteps. And here are the, the adjectives you've just heard. It should be our marketing message. Stricken, smitten, afflicted by God, pierced, bruised, chastened, Stripes, as in whip marks. Come to countryside. <laughs> and the world will consider you stricken, smitten, afflicted, not by your enemies, but by God. The world will consider you heretics to the very God you say you worship. The world will pierce you, will bruise you, the world will chasten you and seek to whip you into shape. And by this you will serve the world. Come, worship with us at Countryside Church.
He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who of his generation considered him cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people? To them the stroke was due, and he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Isaiah is talking about Israel here, the nation, the scapegoat nation for the rest of the world. Israel is bearing the burdens of the violence and the hatred throughout the world. This whole idea of scapegoat comes from Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement celebration where the chief priests of the temples in Jerusalem, or even before Jerusalem, from Leviticus 16 even, the original tabernacle of the Exodus. These stories come down where the chief priest symbolically lays all the sins and the violence and the anger and the oppression and the guilt of all the people on this goat. And then they banish the goat out into the wilderness. This practice still continues in our minds, in our hearts, in our thoughts. We think about scapegoats all the time. And this is Israel. Isaiah is claiming that Israel is in fact the scapegoat, the one who bears the burdens of the violence and the oppression in the world, enduring exile, threatening their very existence, their very identity of God's chosen people. This is Israel. How many of you remember Gandhi's India? Imagine the people of India, walking arm in arm in a straight line, advancing toward the police who are hired there to stop their advancements. And as they make their step forward, the police beat them down until they could no longer advance. And then another line steps forward and the police beat them down. And there is another line, and they step forward, and another beating, and another line, and another beating, and another line. Who are the criminals here. Is this justice? Oppressed and afflicted. 
taken away. And who of his generation considered him cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my Yet it was the Lord's will to bruise him and to put him to grief. When he has made his soul an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Because of his anguish, he will be satisfied. Through knowledge of him, my righteous servant will justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and will divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's quite a terrifying line, isn't it? Yet it was the Lord's will to bruise him and to put him to grief? Does God will to bruise us, to put us to grief? Is this the God we are worshiping tonight? The context in which these lines are written was the great Babylonian exile of the sixth century. Many, as they languished in exile, believed that they were put there not because Marduk, the god of the Babylonians, was more powerful than Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, but because Yahweh had stepped aside, removed Yahweh's protection from the people of Israel because of their transgressions, and therefore they were sent to, to, into exile as a result of their sins. But as the exile wore on, there was a growing intuition that they were receiving far more punishment than any sin they had ever received. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, who arose, the one who arose, spoke, speaking in the words like Isaiah, who was known as Second Isaiah, um, Israel has received double for all her sins. And these suffering servant songs then come from this context in which Isaiah looks at the sufferings of Israel, which are more than they had ever committed, more punishment than they had ever committed, and says, you know what, there's redemption to value here. 
that the world is laying upon us, that it's bruising us, and through our bruises, the world will come to be healed. We are taking upon the punishment upon ourselves that the world deserves in their sin. By our stripes, they will be healed. There's only one problem with that. It appears that the world was not healed. The world continued to go on as it did before. And Israel itself, at emerging from exile, was no suffering servant by which the, all the nations become blessed through their wounds. And so there arose another idea that maybe that suffering servant wasn't really Israel itself. Christians have looked back and said, what Israel could not do, Jesus did. Israel could not be that ultimate scapegoat for the world, what the world will lay upon their sins and cast out in the wilderness and then be atoned for. But Jesus could be that scapegoat. As an innocent, the world could lay their sins upon him and he could then take upon himself the punishment that the world deserved. There's only one problem with that. That was the farthest thing from Jesus' mind. Oh, Jesus did see himself as taking on the role that Israel could not. He saw himself in these suffering servant songs, and the tradition saw him there as well. But nobody thought of him as the ultimate scapegoat that atoned for our sins for a thousand years after he came. It took a full thousand years for Christians to figure out that kind of theology. They'd forgotten what their ancient predecessors knew, that Jesus did not come to be our scapegoat to atone for our sins. Jesus came to Jerusalem during the festival of the Passover, and the festival of the Passover, they do not sacrifice the Passover scapegoat, that's Yom Kippur, they sacrifice the Passover lamb. What's the difference? Only just about everything, especially when you add the twist that Jesus puts on the Passover lamb. You remember the story of the Passover. The Jews languish as slaves in Egypt. Moses comes demanding in God's name to let God's people go. Pharaoh resists. The plagues come. Resists all the more. The plagues are, are raised until finally, in utter exasperation, God instructs Moses to instruct the Israelites to slaughter a lamb on one particular evening and put the, dash the blood against the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house. And then the Spirit of God would come over Egypt and slay the firstborn children of the Egyptians. But in every house where there was the blood of the lamb, those would remain untouched. That God would pass over the houses of the innocent slaves. And only the guilty Egyptians would suffer the wrath of God. Only when Jesus becomes, comes for the Passover festival, inviting us to crown him king and anoint him as high priest, and we reject him, Jesus then becomes the Passover lamb, only reinterpreted with Jesus' twist. Because we remember that in the Passover of old, God protects the innocent and God's wrath is poured out against the guilty. But if Jesus is the Passover lamb, then the ones who are slaying him are the guilty. The ones who slay him, in fact, are more guilty than anyone in all of human history has ever been. Guiltier than Cain, guiltier than Adam and Eve in the garden. Slaying the Messiah of God, and yet the Messiah who is the Passover lamb? starting to make the connections? This is no Passover of old. The Passover that Jesus is instituting is one in which the guilty are passed over. 
In other words, God has not been waiting for all eternity to smite you and I, to send us into the fiery hell of torment, just waiting. And if it weren't for Jesus coming and God ushering violence against Jesus, then finally, you know, now we're safe. No, if Jesus is this kind of Passover lamb, it means that God has loved us from eternity. That God's love and grace extends to us even in our most guiltiest state. It also means that our sins actually are not washed clean in Jesus. They're forgiven in Jesus. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. No, Jesus is not our Passover scapegoat. He is our Passover lamb, which means the love and the grace of God is here for us and with us even though we send Jesus to the cross. With God's love and forgiveness as close as our next breath, the only thing that keeps us separate from God is ourselves. Jesus shows us this. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is the one that we haven't turned over to the forgiveness of God.
we confess that we didn't really want to be here. For at the base of your cross, your shadow extends and touches us. It feels like an accusation. We get this sinking feeling that we put you here, not they. And yet at the base of this cross, we feel this strange attraction, this quiet intuition. O Lamb of God, Christ, our Passover, we know you to be the Spirit of the living God made known to us in the one crucified this night. The God who goes before us to show us the way, who goes above us to watch over us, who goes beneath us to uphold us and uplift us, who goes beside us to be our strong and constant companion, our God who dwells within us to remind us that we are surely not alone on this strange and mysterious journey of life, that we are loved, loved beyond our wildest imagination. O oh God, may the fire of your blessing burn brightly upon us and within us, now and always. Amen.